I call this presentation um, Solid Ground or No Man's Land. Uh, and in a way, um, I was trying to address several issues. Uh, hopefully, some of them will relate to what has been said just, just now in the, in, the, in the previous panel. Uh, I really liked the metaphor of the fish <coughs> swimming in water and not realizing that it was water they were swimming in, because that's very similar to my no man's land metaphor. And I would like to talk about university curricula, uh, particularly about the, the curriculum of our translation studies. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think uh, a lot of you who are in education or work at universities, you will agree with me uh, that a lot of university curricula uh, have believed themselves to be very solid, standing on the solid ground of philology, uh, curricula, and, and uh, using <clears throat> syllabi that uh, reflected linguistic studies uh, to a great extent. But of course, now that, that's been changing, and uh, translation and interpreting studies have come in. And um, so what happened as a result was that there's this clash of several different types of stakeholders all claiming to know best, and none of them really doing their job right, um, if I may say that. Uh, so you know, this no man's land is, we, we would like to prepare students for the market, but what is the market really? And I think it has already been said several times that the market is not only something that tends to be quite vague, because there are freelancers, there are people who work for companies, there are people who work for institutions such as European institutions, and they need to be prepared in different ways. So how can you do that universally? Um, well, of course, the answer is you can't, <laughs> or at least it's very difficult. Uh, so what, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be very specific about some of the things that we do, and this will hopefully connect to some of the... Um, some of the points that have already been made. Well, we basically have uh, our department at university in Bratislava, Comenius University, uh, the English department, has two main programs. One is translation and interpreting, and the other one is in teacher training. Um, we, in terms of um, creating a connection between university curricula, <clears throat> or the one that we're using, and the real world, the market out there, where our students or our graduates go after they finish. Um, we basically take two different approaches. One is, um, it, as part of the curriculum, we, we, we've created internships very similar to some of those that are presented in the posters outside that I saw um, uh, at different universities in Europe. And then extracurricular activities, of which I would like to talk more. Um, different events, presentations, workshops, job fairs, um, and then also the very vague area of art, which many people say, you know, it's just this kind of fun game activity that shouldn't really be part of a curriculum. I would like to argue, perhaps slightly subversively, that maybe that's not true. And the study program, this little cloud um, in between, is where it ideally should all merge. So, uh, talking about the, um, the, the, the activities that are part of the curriculum. Internships, I think I will, I will be repeating what a lot of people have said before me, um, not just today, but um, in the previous years, what the, the experience of other universities and their department has already shown, that this is something um, that gives the students an idea and also an opportunity to join uh, and do activities that will later become part of their job. Uh, again, what we do basically, we have a spe specific internship program um, as part of our faculty. So this is part of our curriculum. There is a, uh, a department, or rather a center, for um, translation and interpreting internships that was created uh, and that takes care of the, the administration of this. And in it, students, um, I don't think the word hired is correct because they're not exactly hired for money, but it's part of a program that is being run by teachers who are also professional. I'm going to have to break your throat and ask you to sit down because we're having problems with the cameras and streaming you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'll <laughs> I wanted to make things more dynamic by standing up and by... Uh, showing you slides, but yeah, I'll try to uh, I'll try to continue. Like, is this better? 
whoever is operating well, I like the camera. you standing up, but you know, we have to. That's all right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> think well, I, can, I, can, I can work with that. It's just it's very difficult for me to see everybody. <laughs> and oh, all right. So um, mostly students work for um, uh, for translation agencies, um, but but I think the the majority of of work has come from from NGOs. I can show you a few. Um, few figures. Um, if, you, if you look at this, I don't know how much of this you can see at the very back, but the orange part is, um, this is division according to the type of client for which the uh, clients to, for which the students work. The orange one, which is almost a half, is, NGO, is uh, festivals and cultural events. Uh, and the, the, the blue one is, is NGOs and translation agencies is the gray one. So the majority uh, of work is done for, the, for this type of client. Um, then uh, this is the number of pages, which is again um, mostly done for for the third sector NGOs and then uh, festivals and agencies. Um, skipped one, well, never mind. But it's that was a, a division according to uh, language, predominantly English. Um, so uh, the other thing that I would like to mention, um, and it's it's it's, the, it's the, I'm coming to the second half of my presentation is the extracurricular activities that we do. This is something that has been picked up by people who are part of the industry, people who are um, uh, in charge of running professional organizations, uh, and they uh, have welcomed this welcomed this opportunity to come to our school and communicate to students what the market in translation and interpreting is all about. We have two different um, uh, events. One is uh, the Days of St. Jerome, the patron um, of uh, translators, as you know. Uh, and this is a two-day event in, in which um, translators, professionals, um, the Slovak associations of translators and interpreters come and lead discussions, panel discussions, lectures, workshops, uh, seminars with students and people from the industry uh, about their future work, I mean the students' future work. This is something that is very interesting not only for students but also for people who are already translators. They usually come and join these activities. Sometimes they even pay for them. They're free for students uh, but some of these workshops are very practical and um, it has become, um, it has become a, a tradition. Um, this would be a panel discussion, um, a picture. This is a picture. We have a really great representative place where this, uh, where this uh, is organized. I think you can even see me in the, in the front row. <clears throat> and uh, there are people who, um, s some of whom um, work as professional translators and they're also uh, part-time or full-time employed at the department. Uh, then the other um, activity that we do is called Lingua Market, which is basically a job fair where we invite uh, agencies, uh, potential employers of students to come and uh, basically do their headhunting of sorts, but present the, the market requirements and job requirements that the students will have to deal with once they graduate and, um, uh, and start looking for a job. Or even while they're students and are looking for a job, uh, I guess they could do the same. Um, and this, it's, it's, it's organized in the same place. Um, students come and go um, and are presented um, with, um, disc and they, they have a chance to join discussions about uh, what it is like to be a professional translator or interpreter. Uh, they're given materials, they're told all the information that they might be interested in. Um, there are workshops um, uh, by potential employers and so on. Um, but I would like to um, conclude in, in about five minutes um, talking about something else. We, there has been a few instances where, when people mentioned, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, this is something that the World Economic Forum came up with uh, some time ago. And it's about the, the shift of skills that will be necessary for the labor market um, in, 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 well, now it's in three years. Uh, so for university standards, this is too late to start thinking about it now, um, obviously, because it takes some time to come up with uh, curricula and to put them in place, and then it takes several years for the students to graduate. Uh, but of course, um, 
I was looking at our curriculum, for example, uh, and I was looking at it from the point of view of translation studies and realized that we do very little to foster these particular skills. And I uh, felt slightly ashamed for, for allowing that to happen. So um, <clears throat> I was thinking, um, I started thinking about how this could be addressed. And of course, there are ways uh, of addressing it. Uh, these extracurricular activities that we're doing might be some of them. Uh, but I also try to um, uh, support people who are doing other extracurricular activities which don't seem to have um, a direct connection to the jobs they will be doing, like theatre, for example. Uh, we have a theatre group at the department. This sounds slightly silly, maybe, you know, but a lot of people running on a stage, making silly faces, and sometimes taking their clothes off and then putting them back on again and <laughs> singing boisterously and, and, and that kind of stuff, uh, doing you know some physical activities as well on stage. But um, for the theatre group at our department, I think uh, more of the skills that you saw in the previous table uh, are actually important than when they are when they take part in our classes, they work as a team, which is something we don't necessarily foster in uh, in our curriculum. Um, you know, translation has always been considered to be some kind of solitary confinement, where you have to work on your own, which is not true when you look at the market. Uh, we kind of forgot about that, but working. Um, for a theatre group at the department like this, of course, uh, it is teamwork, it's project management, it's marketing, it's using the language, it's being creative, it's problem solving, it's dealing with um, uh, other people who are part of the business. Uh, they run their own um, association, so there's um, well, accounting as part of that, tax returns, it's everything. It's this whole complex of uh, running uh, your own company in a way. Uh, then the other thing, um, this is really sensitive, I always keep skipping, but the, the other thing that they do is they uh, publish their own magazine, which again, uh, something that seems very obvious, but the same set of skills are put in place again. Uh, editorial skills, um, invoicing, <laughs> working in a team, deciding on who is going to tell who to do what. It's project management at its best again. Um, so to conclude, um, um, I was thinking that all these activi activities should be perhaps highlighted and intensified in the years to come to, to create something that I rather unimaginatively called a modern language curriculum, but something that would be rather open and would address some of the um, skills uh, that were mentioned. I particularly liked modesty and I particularly liked curiosity. I also, uh, but I would extend this to uh, include also self-respect, which is something that is very rarely uh, discussed in universities. But when you become a freelancer, for example, I think that's the number one skill you need. Well, it's not a skill. I mean, it's actually a, it's a lifestyle to some extent. So, um, and then to make these extracurricular activities perhaps part of a curriculum, to have an open curriculum that would be more flexible and dynamic, that would prepare students for a more flexible and dynamic working environment, but also to allow, for example, professionals from other fields, from other disciplines, uh, like I think uh, Miguel Savner said was from biology, to be able to enter our program, say, at master's level, and uh, be able to use their skills and transfer them to, uh, to our linguistic studies or combine them in the end. Uh, so create something that would be much op more open and flexible. But of course, one problem that we have is called accreditation, which is, of course, a very, I'm sure you will be talking about that as well, it's a very difficult administrative um, and a big administrative obstacle to, to, to jump over. So um, at, the, at, at the moment, um, this is, um, it says, reserved for Godot. Uh, so at a moment, it seems like waiting for Godot. Uh, you can call me naive, but I think our Godot in this particular situation will come one day. So uh, with that hope, thank you. Thank you.
Uh, just before we move on to Scylla, can I ask you, go back to that slide where you showed us uh, 2020 and 2015, and if we can call up the Slido results of the poll, the last one we did, because I was struck, there was one word up there, if we have the word cloud, um, can we get that up on screen as well? There is, yeah, there is quite a bit of crossover. Because what was number three on your list of skills required for 2020 was creativity. And as you can see here, creativity is actually coming up here. Management, which is the same here as people management, I'm guessing. There's a lot of crossover. So how surprised are you that you know, people are already identifying what the skills are needed? I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, when I was looking at this first, it was maybe a couple of years ago, um, and, uh, well, it actually, it should, you know, probably was in 2015, but creativity was number 10, and now it's number 3. Um, so for some reason, um, it's, it's been given more importance, and people have recognised that importance. And, of course, creativity is one of those vague words that, I mean, you know, everybody seems to agree that it's important, but what is it exactly? How do you foster it? Where does talent that you mentioned come in and so on? So. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that everyone in the room is, was already ahead of the game and, you know, we didn't need your presentation at all. <laughs> so let's turn to you. There we go. Okay. This is a great honour to have the opportunity to talk about the international project that we are involved in, <clears throat> because it was conceived with the very purpose of our topic today, to um, create synergies, to uh, bridge the gap between the translation market and higher education institution, and to bring translators and translation stakeholders together. And I'm going to explain the title that you can see on the screen, Innovative, Inclusive and Fit for Market Training for Specialised Translators. It's a long one and we try to squeeze it into an acronym where E means innovative, transfer is a synonym for translation and the FAIR suffix, we thought it was uh, very innovative at the time. FAIR refers to the fact that we would like to include a large number of disadvantaged people and I will come back to this. This is an Erasmus Plus uh, project, a strategic partnership, uh, KA2. Uh, some words about the partners. I am representing the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, and I'm here in my capacity as the head of Center for Interpreter and Translator Training. And we have uh, two other partners. It's a relatively small consortium. We have representatives who were uh, members of the previous discussion panels. Uh, Univi, the University of Vienna, as another higher education institution. And we had uh, Hermes Traduciones, a Madrid-based uh, uh, Spanish translation company, uh, whose manager, Juan Jose Aravalillo, who, was, uh, who you could hear earlier on, is also a vice president of UATC responsible for liaising with higher education institutions. So we have a market representative and we have two higher education institutions. You can see our website here and you are invited to keep track of our activities and also contribute because cooperation, as you will see, will be one of my greatest buzzwords here and uh, invitation uh, to pool resources. Uh, in the project life cycle, which is three years, and we started off last September and will finish uh, at the end of August 2019, we have and we will have uh, worked out seven intellectual outputs. Now, the first one, which was a quest really to pursue, is uh, a new competence profile. You know, we have new profiles as another buzzword uh, in our conference today, and we decided to narrow down the competences that are, that are needed for specialized translators, uh, tailor make it based on the previous projects that had the same intention and the same focus. And I would like to pinpoint and call your attention to two particular competences that we identified. Uh, revision and review competence. We thought that with the advance of uh, machine translation, it's a new skill that specialized translators need. Uh, and also post-editing and professional competence, which 
has not been defined in terms of knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, as the other competences were, but we tried to break it down into smaller units and see what uh, specialized translators need to be familiar with, just like the EMT competence uh, profile did. And we identified entrepreneurship as a major uh, topic, uh, customer care, marketing, project management, and quality management. These are the major issues here. You can see the full profile uh, at our website already uh, uploaded. Now, um, these are the elements, the competences which we consider to be body parts or little elements that make up the skeleton, which is our training scheme. We refer to this as transferable training scheme. And what we actually did when identifying the individual elements beside the competence card that we developed, we looked at various market surveys, including the EU ATC one conducted last year and this year. Also, we looked at graduate surveys, CUT and EMT surveys, and we had two SWOT analyses conducted. One was carried out by the University of Vienna. They compared EMT universities and looked at the strengths and opportunities uh, via desktop research to see how these strengths could be built into our new curriculum. While we in Hungary conducted uh, 13 interviews with 13 heads of uh, training institutions uh, focusing on specialized translation, and we also identified well, all those strengths and opportunities, especially that are uh, important on the Hungarian market, which is quite a different market from the other European markets. Now, if we have the skeleton as the training scheme, uh, what is going to be the flesh and the muscles on well, the body? Uh, this is probably the most interesting part of our project, and that's going to be the e-modules. So what we are going to do, and we are in this very uh, phase right now in our project, is to develop seven e-modules, which are materials uh, that will be use online on all Moodle uh, portals and online other online surfaces. So these are PPTs, uh, textual materials, exam questions, videos, and expert interviews. So this is a, a large body of material that we are going to make available to our partners and to other institutions who are interested. And these are the topics that you can see here that e-modules will be developed for. So project management, and entrepreneurship. This will be developed by our market representative uh, and CAT tools and technology, which we consider obviously of utmost importance, will be developed by UNIV as well as localization. And we in Budapest, we have the expertise for terminology and revision and review. So this will be the material that we will work out. So what makes the scheme flexible and transferable? These are other two buzzwords that we uh, decided to focus on. Uh, these e-modules uh, will be built according to learning outcomes, and you can actually decide how big a portion you want to incorporate into your own training schemes. So we will have shorter versions and longer versions, so different options. So that that's why we would like to say that it is flexible and also transferable, because you will have different options as to just how much to, to take from these materials. So you will have uh, your little uh, options in your training scheme. Now, this is where the word cooperation comes in, and this is where I would like to in, uh, invite all uh, the colleagues, not only in the room, but out there across Europe, to contribute with ideas, because we will have a portal, and on our website it's already up and running, we will have a pool of assessment techniques. So what we would like to see is to collect a large number of assessment techniques uh, for self-assessment, for peer assessment, formal, non-formal, innovative assessment techniques. So we would like to invite you to contribute, to cooperate, and if you upload your assessment techniques on our website, you will get access to a restricted area uh, on our site where you can have more material of what we have achieved during the project. Um, there is another intellectual output. This is number five, which is called a spur. This is a synonym for motivation. It's a um, 
provided for use as a kind of incentives motivational guide. And in the framework of this, we are going to uh, work out guidelines and technical specifications as to how to use Moodle, how to use uh, our materials, how to use the e-modules. And as part of this, we are going to also work out a detailed uh, guideline as to how to involve uh, people with, with various disadvantages. And this is my patch part of the project, uh, the methodology portal. So it's not only assessment techniques that we are looking for, that we are fishing for, it's also methodological ideas, anything that you think will help the training of specialized translators. So we will have a, a huge portal where we collect all these ideas. So it's really an invitation for, for contribution. I can just reiterate what I have said. Uh, but this is, this is a, a, well, a place where you can uh, contribute with different ideas. And this will bring us finally to well, uh, our vision, which is the end product of our uh, cooperation and project, uh, a European uh, well, training, a cent center for specialized translation training. Actually, we have just modified the name, then we have come up with a new acronym, and it says ECOST, Center for Online Specialized Translator Training. And E, well, referring to the fact that it's free of charge and everybody can join in. So it's, uh, first we wanted to make it a, a central European center, but apart from the fact that it sounds a bit silly, we also thought that we should extend the scope and invite other people from Europe to join in. And we really hope that it's going to be a, a European, a pan-European center where we can pool all our resources and we, where we can share ideas for assessment and methodologies. And well, once again, about the focal points, I think innovativeness, I have already uh, mentioned there are several reasons why we can call our project innovative for being digital, uh, for, being, for focusing on new items and for, for being uh, related to the market. But inclusivity is something that I would like to just explain what we mean by well, inclusiveness. We would like to involve people who are either in, uh, in, have difficult, different impairments, like confined to a wheelchair, or maybe parents, fathers or mothers on a maternity leave, and also people who live in distant and remote geographical areas who would other ha otherwise have no access to these training schemes. And we actually offer 50% discount from our training fees if they join our courses, and we are going to work out the guidelines as to how we can involve these people, how we can actually trace them and find them uh, via different organizations that deal with this uh, uh, group. And fit for market, I think there is no need to uh, emphasize that because we have been working with the market. We have a, a valuable partner and this is something that we really pay big attention to. Uh, just going back, sorry, to the last one because this, this is where I would like to stop a little bit and spend three minutes if I have the time uh, to talk about uh, BMEs, my universities. Uh, achievements in bringing uh, the market closer to the higher education institution. These are three initiatives, so-called immersion programs, where we actually give our students the opportunity to try themselves on the market. And the first one is an internship that lasts for six months, and this is already part at up and up and uh, running in our training scheme, that we provide our trainees with six months of internship. And we preferably want it to be a paid internship. And uh, the market representatives or the, mar the translation offices will have uh, the, the opportunity to select the trainees. So this is something that we really would like to see. Secondly, we have this mentoring scheme. It has been mentioned today, but we actually change the scheme every year based on the feedback we receive. And last year, we had a very educational uh, cooperation with our mentors because the volunteers had to work as a team. They had to uh, decide what form of a company they would establish. They had to come up with a business plan. They had to make price quotations. So we actually threw them into deep water, as we say in Hungary, and they really had to 
start, start operating as a small translation company with all the positive and negative factors, of course. And they had group mentoring, they had individual mentoring, and this is what we are trying to do to focus uh, m this mentoring scheme on different areas such as court interpreting because we have a conference interpreting course as well or maybe rap translation and we invite different stakeholders, different members of the translation market and this is what our last uh, uh, idea is about. The market trainee events. We actually call them Trainees Meet Professionals. That's the new title, where we invite people uh, uh, on a monthly basis to give a presentation and we have a Q&A discussion afterwards so students have the opportunity to ask questions from all these stakeholders and it has proved to be a very interesting and very valuable exercise. So. Uh, we look forward to your contributions. I have some brochures here with me in English and one who has brought some uh, Spanish language uh, uh, brochures where you can have the website. You can, you can see all the individual intellectual outputs that I have just described. And, well, I really look forward to your contribution. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, well, don't forget, you can still send in your questions, and I have two very specific ones for you. The first one, I think, is quite a, a yes or no question, which is, do you provide training and specialisation for professionals, or are there your programmes only for young students? Uh, we, actually, we actually provide training for postgraduate students. We don't have master courses, but actually we are now trying to, um, to create courses uh, during the weekend for professionals because it turned out we have received some feedback that they would like to get some further training. So ongoing professional development is something that uh, our colleagues uh, realize more and more, especially in the field of interpreting. It seems that even uh, working professionals need some refreshment, some update on the new skills in terms of, for instance, simultaneous interpreting or note-taking in particular, but in translation as well, CAT tools is something that, well, courses are being offered not only for our uh, undergraduates or, or postgraduate students, but also for our trainers. So the train the trainer bit is, is also something that we would like to see uh, enhanced and strengthened. And is it international or just in Hungary? Well, in Hungary. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then Anna has asked a question, which is, do bigger industry players from Hungary, like MemoQ, etc., support your initiative and if they do, how? Explain a little bit about that. Yes, MamoQ, we're very proud of uh, Kilgray, which uh, has um, a, a big role in our, our training uh, schemes, not only at our university, but in the whole Hungarian uh, spectrum, because they provide the Hungarian universities with free uh, software. So we can use not only the trainers, but also the students have a free uh, software they can use. And they have just participated in our autumn conference, so Kilgray, uh, supports us with all kinds of ways and also other uh, stakeholders on the Hungarian market play a big role. Well, a question to both of you then about maybe how we make internships more meaningful. I mean, is there a difference between a traditional internship and, for example, shadowing a professional on, on a really day-to-day -day basis? Ivan, would you want to perhaps? Well, both of you can answer that. I don't know, I don't know if there's a big difference, but... Um, we cooperate with um, associations, with professional associations, who, who have offered um, the help of professionals, um, either a mentoring scheme, or it's um, it works on a, on on the basis of uh, taking groups of students to go and have a look, dummy booths, for example, or do do things, um, do projects which uh, then are partly done by the students. But I don't th I think it, the more opportunities the students get, the better, I think, and the, the, the greater variety, the better for them. Okay. Our mentoring scheme is about, actually. When I said uh, they have the opportunity for uh, group mentoring, that means that they work as a little group and they got one mentor, but they also have individual mentors they, with whom they actually work together. So they do pro bono jobs and the mentor corrects 
the translations or gives an opinion on the interpreting and it's a kind of shadowing so they they go to the jobs they they go together with the mentor they sit down together they discuss um well all the morals of the story and the educational findings so it's i think it's a very uh useful scheme it um, presupposes a lot of work on the part of the department because it's voluntary, uh, but I think it's worthwhile. Let me just ask, uh, again, the room, so we get a, another feeling of where everyone's coming from. How many of you were an intern at some point in your career, if you've been an intern? Okay, and how many of you weren't? That's a surprisingly high number. How, how do you react to this sort of... Do you think that it is a 50-50 split in the industry at large? <laughs> I think it's, I mean, it, as far as I remember, it, there were these phases in terms of to what extent professionals were willing to cooperate. For example, um, I mean, in Slovakia, before 2004, when Slovakia joined the EU, there was a lot of work for the very few people who were there and who were good, so they didn't really have enough time to, to do any mentoring or to offer internships. They were you know, busy doing their own stuff. Uh, then it changed, and so suddenly there were a lot of people who were willing to, to provide this. Uh, and now it seems the market has changed. The, the, there's, you know, the prices go down. <laughs> and so on, so professionals are less willing again maybe to cooperate, so maybe it has to do with that. But I don't think, I think, th th I see our department's role in this as crucial. We should be this uh, facilitators of that, and, and it requires a lot of work, not only on de in, in the department as such, but also in basically <laughs> trying to convince people who are out there working on the market to help and to, to be part of this, uh, what some of the previous speakers called community, uh, we, because that's also part of the visib visibility of translators as a profession. Okay, perhaps um, I'm getting comments that perhaps I should have asked how many of those internships were paid, but we will leave that for the moment. Um, now, students and graduates um, often say that they would prefer their training to be more practical and less theoretical. And you don't have to take my word for it, that is actually from a graduate survey from last year. But would that mean that the translation training would be ending up being considered more vocational rather than more academic? And you know, how do you think that would impact the career and, 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 the, and the status? And, and what's your take on that? Um. I think our training is one of the most practical ones in Hungary and we sometimes get some criticism for that because some other universities say that it's the theoretical st stuff that students learn at university, all the practical stuff they will learn at the market. And it's a craft, so actually we are teaching them things at the university what, that they will not learn on the market. Uh, for instance, some students complain that why should they deal with uh, uh, cultural things and realia and these kind of things because what they need to do to translate on the market is uh, specifications and, and uses manual and stuff like that. But they enjoy it and they just realize what the link is between the profession and, and theory. So it really much depends on the curriculum and on the individual institution. I believe that we need to get closer to the market, but as we said, we will not be able to satisfy uh, all stakeholders. We can try. Okay. I, agree. I agree completely. I think we have to f walk a fine line between these two. Um, for, I mean, to put this bluntly, I was approached by several students who said, "Well, why do we have to learn all these um, linguistic theories and you know and, and have, the, have these literature classes?" Um, I was thinking that translation studies would be you teaching me how to translate. I will be translating. I don't want to read or write too much. And uh, so I will be translating texts and you will be telling me what I do wrong until I get it right. <coughs> and I think, you know, so, th so that's an extreme, but I think it reflects the, you know, th there's been media frenzy uh, also about the practicality of university education. And there is a point to that, I think, too much theory uh, without um, any context, I think, is useless. But... Um, it can't be without any theory. So I think it's finding the right, the, the right proportion. Okay, do we have questions from people in the room? Anyone like to 
ask something and see in case there's anyone else. Okay. Thank you. So the question is, how can academia motivate industry to be more active when it goes about internships? I was involved in several uh, events of getting industry and academia in Ukraine, and we are neighbors actually with both of your countries. But still, it doesn't go further than only just speaking. So how, what can be the arguments for industry to be involved more? Thank you. Can I go first? Well, I think that in Hungary, for instance, uh, there are two ways. There are some uh, offices which would just like to get free uh, staff, free workers, but it's, the number is decreasing, I can say. But uh, I think it's their interest as well to have somebody to work for them based on their selection, which they can actually prove to be good enough to stay. So this is what they are looking for, uh, the good offices. Uh, to, to find candidates that could really suit their purposes and it, it, it will turn out in a very short while whether these people will be good enough for them to, to keep. So that's one incentive, I think, on the side of the translation companies, so it works. I totally agree and I also think this is a very good question which uh, I can't answer very easily, but I think it's a never-ending story in our trying to convince uh, professionals and the you know agencies mostly uh, that this is not a chance for them to take advantage of cheap labor because I think that's a line that we don't want them to cross like you already said earlier it's it, I mean it there are people like that who would want to do that but that is not the point it's something that goes back to the visibility idea and the sense of community uh, which we should somehow convince them to understand. But if you ask me how exactly, then I would probably stutter for a few minutes. But I mean, there are ways of how you can talk to them, but it's very difficult. Well, I think we've possibly identified one of the issues there, which is, uh, as you can see the question on our poll, which is, I am a freelancer and I take on interns. With so much of the industry is freelance, I guess that poses its own challenges in whether you have the insurance even to take on an intern. Um, okay, any more questions from the floor? Yes, lady over here. Thank you very much. Sorry. I think this question is probably more for the previous panel than the current panel. I'm sorry, but I did have my hand up. And uh, um, Anyway, I'll, I'll launch it. And if you decide you want to keep the question right to the end, I don't mind either. What I'm thinking is that there were two translation companies earlier on this morning that referred to themselves as the bogeyman or the enemy. So um, while they are a major part of the industry, they also see and recognise, and it can't be very pleasant, I guess, for them to, to, to feel that, as regards the freelance translator, that they, they are the enemy. They are the people with whom the, the freelance translator has to deal in ways that aren't always very satisfactory. To my mind, the real enemy is the end client who does not understand the work skills, expertise, knowledge required to produce a good translation. So my proposition is that translation companies and freelance translators need to work much more closely together in order to educate the end client, especially as regards the time needed to deliver a quality translation and to have the proper financial reward for doing so. And that ties in a bit with the discussion about whether you're a freelance translator or a language consultant or whatever. In the real world, people who call themselves consultants get paid and they tend to say when they will deliver a project. That isn't an option that most freelance translators have. And to my mind, it's the freelance translation community working together with the translation companies who need to try to find a solution to that because the translation companies are also under pressure from the end client and they say they have no choice. The client says on Thursday morning, I want it delivered by lunchtime Friday and the translation company tries to um, satisfy them because otherwise they think they won't get any more work and then they have to transfer that pressure to the freelancer. It's unsatisfactory, but the freelance translator is right at the end of the chain and not really in a position to do anything about it. Thank you. Okay, um, not so much a question, I think, because I presume both of you are just going to agree with, with what was said. Um, but perhaps um, 
we should look at, at this, this question of tools and skills. And one of the things that people said they wanted to develop was this marketing skill. Do you think that's marketing as in the value of, of what I do? Is that something, is, is that on, was that on your list of things to learn for 2020? It's right there, um, and we should um, we should teach students some skills in the, in, in that department also. But um, <clears throat> it's not easy, of course. Uh, but I think I mean there are <laughs> there are several things that come into um, into this discussion at the same time. Uh, I think it's partly also. Um, because part of the marketing is recognizing what the job is all about, which is what this previous comment was on, which some other people also raised, um, to um, be able to show the value, and not just in financial terms, but what it means to do a translation and to do it well. I was looking at these posters outside, and we did something very similar. We did a survey where we asked, um, I can't remember the result, and I can't remember which university it was, but... Uh, it basically said that uh, people who studied translation as part of a linguistic program recognize uh, its worth much more than those who don't. And they tend to think of this as some kind of vocational uh, training. And it, it, it's even reflected in the end in how uh, much they get paid for it. Uh, I mean, it's just statistics, so it doesn't necessarily mean this is you know, the ultimate truth. But I think there is some truth to that. that in order to recognize what it is all about, it shouldn't only be considered a set of skills that I'm going to learn you know, through Moodle on a few winter evenings, but rather something much more comp But some people think, that, well, that's what it is. And it's part of this. I think it's part of our ability to market this uh, profession, recognizing what it is really about and what it really means to be doing it well. Going back to the previous comment, I think it, something just occurred to me, you know, as to how to educate the client, because uh, in this uh, intellectual output five, uh, when we write incentives and the guidelines, it might be there might be an opportunity to write uh, a guideline about this. The question is, which client on which market? Uh, Hungary is a very special market because we have a big company, a state-owned company, uh, where translation is a monopoly. So probably this market is completely different from the Spanish or from the, from the German market. But I think we might be able to put down a basic checklist what clients should be aware of. Uh, and I think it would be a nice initiative and we might be able to find some room in our project for that. Okay, well, I think, I mean, it's quite a, quite a challenging comment, and the title of this panel is actually Reshaping the Market, but if we can't even quite identify the market, that is, that is a big issue. Uh, we're getting quite a few different sorts of comments on Slido, which is some people saying that translation companies only represent their own interests and not those of the freelancers, and then other people saying that my end clients are my friends. So, I mean, you've got a really vast, broad range of, of attitudes to the end client. Um, any more questions from the room before I ask each of our panelists just to... Yes, right down here at the back. Yep, I can see you. I can see a navy hand. <laughs> yep. Doris Krollmann, La Chambre Belge des Traducteurs et Interprètes. I'm from the Belgian Chamber of Translators and Interpreters. One question which is never really addressed in the universities, or practically not, is how do you calculate a price? It's absolutely essential for freelancers and to avoid a downward spiral of prices. And um, uh, it's important that we don't have people who are very competent actually um, losing out because they don't know what they need in order to uh, make a living. And then how do you explain to the final customer what is the work of a translator? What is a good product? In order to do that, you have to um, also uh, train a translator to be able to explain to the client what they can expect of a translation and what actually makes a translation a good one. Questions? Silla, do you want to take the... I only heard the question itself, but not the comment. Okay, well, go with the question then. 
I only heard a question, yeah. uh, not a comment. But I think um, when we teach revision and review, this is what we are doing. We are trying to explain our choices as trainers and as students, and this is where actually we we can teach this skill to our students how to stand up for their choices. And I think, um, uh, for instance, one who is also a, a market uh, representative and teaches this in a university, uh, this would be a good combination just to have the inside of those people who can see both uh, areas and both directions, perhaps. And, and is there a sense of we need to teach translators how to how to work out what to charge, what, what price, what market they should be in. I mean, not to say a cartel, but, you know. Well, entrepreneurship, this, this is the skill, uh, yeah. the professional skills that I, I was talking about is one of the major competences, and this is what we are going to work out uh, as a, a part of the e-modules. And perhaps if uh, there are some ideas coming in, we can uh, formulate or reshape uh, the content of the e-module and add some more elements that the colleagues consider to be important.